Hi. So today I would like to answer a bunch of questions that I've been getting in my inbox, uh, most of them with expletives. So far I have about 140 messages in my inbox related to that video on uh, BGA chipsets that was posted to Vessel on the Linus Tech Tips channel. So I would say about a, of 140 messages, I would say at least 110 of them have a bit of cursing in them. My, don't get me wrong, my kind of people. I'm a cursing person myself when something aggravates me. So I figured I would take this time to answer a lot of these questions because... Answering the same question over and over again by typing it makes no sense. This is something Eli, the computer guy, taught me in, a, in an email. He said, if you're going to answer a question over and over again, why don't you answer it in a video so that you don't have to retype it out? So I'm going to go over most of the questions that I got here in these messages. I'm going to try to rephrase them without the expletives to have a, a, a non-expletive video, if that's even possible. And uh, yeah, I hope, hope, hopefully this will answer a lot of the questions people have. If you've heard me talk about reballing and reflowing and all that stuff already, skip over this video. I, I am beating a dead horse with this video, but I'm hoping that it answers some of the questions that people have. First question, what is the real problem? If the problem is not the solder balls, then what is actually going on? The real issue is going to be with the bumps inside the flip chip design. All right, so let me show you what's going on here. I'm going to use this picture over here, which is from a Texas Instruments PDF, uh, you know, just some, some data sheet or something on flip chip ball grid array package designs. And this is just a really, really basic oversimplification and a picture of what's going on inside of these BGA graphics chips. So over here you have the solder balls that are going to attach the chip to the board itself. But then you have these, these little bumps over here. So the real issue is going to be with these C4 bumps that attach the silicone up here to the substrate down here. This is where the problem is, inside the chip. And the thing is that this is completely encapsulated on underfill. See where it says underfill over here? Think of underfill like an epoxy of some sort. So what they do is right when they're designing this chip, the bumps are there, and before they seal the chip up, they encapsulate it in underfill to protect the bumps from any type of shock or any type of any type of movement that, that, may, that may damage them. Since this is going to be encapsulated in underfill, it's impossible to get to these bumps, so it's impossible to actually fix the actual chip itself. So once the chip dies, you have to replace it. Now you may ask, well, when I heat the, when I heat the board, it works again, or when I heat this chip, it works again, so what am I actually doing? Why does it work again? And that is a very, very good question that we should cover. So let's say that these bumps over here crack, or they break away, or this bump moves over here when it's supposed to be over here. Let's say there's a break in the bump somehow. Well, when you heat this chip to, let's say, 150 or 160 or 170 Celsius, which is far below the temperature needed to melt the lead-free solder in these electronics, when you heat it to that temperature, this underfill is going to move around. It's going to ooze around a little bit. If you heat glue or you heat an epoxy or anything like that, you're going to notice it kind of moves around a little. And, w and since there's no room inside of here, because this underfill was shoved in there while it was being manufactured, it's going to force these bumps to move. So let's say one of these bumps is broken or malformed in some way. It's going to kind of shove it back into place temporarily. But the reality is that once the underfill goes back to its original position, once the underfill goes back to the position that it was in prior to you heating it, the little bumps over here are going to return to whatever position they were in that caused the chip to be broken. And when that happens, you're going to return to a chip that itself doesn't work. So while an issue in the solder balls can potentially be addressed with this heating, the issue that is happening inside the chip is something that you cannot fix. If a solder ball is cracked, and again, it is not it is not something that happens often that these solder balls crack. It is very much so blown out of proportion that on a stationary piece of hardware that the balls crack. But if something happens with those solder balls, you can potentially fix that with the old chip by reflowing or reballing. The problem here when it comes to graphics chips is that so often the issue is not with the solder balls that you see on the bottom, but rather with those FC bumps that are inside the chip that are encapsulated in underfill. So for a crappy analogy, let's have you ever tried to hang something up or put something together with scotch tape using that $1 roll from the 99 cent store? That very obviously was not intended for what it was you were looking to hang? Uh, so it, we, we all do that sometimes. We've all at some point in our life used scotch tape for something that we probably should not have been using a $1 roll of scotch tape for. So you hang something up, and then when you get home, you realize that it's fell on the floor. Now, what a lot of us may do is we may simply pick that thing up off the floor and hang it again. 
But that doesn't mean that it's now properly hung. See, not only was that scotch tape not good enough to hold whatever it was you were holding to begin with, but now since it's fallen on the floor, the scotch tape has made contact with all the dust and the dirt in the floor for the three or five hours before you came home and picked it up. Any of the little gusts in your apartment would have moved the dust around and gotten more dust to stick to the scotch tape that's now on the floor. So now the scotch tape is weakened. So when you put it up, it's only going to fall down quicker this time. So before, it may have stayed up for five or six hours. The next time you pick it up off the floor and try to hang it with that same piece of scotch tape, now it's only going to stick for two hours. The next time you pick it up and hang it, it's only going to stick for a half hour. It doesn't mean that you've done the job properly just because it happens to stick again when you hang it. The same thing here. You may heat the chip and it may work again, but it's not going to work for as long as it was working originally. So if you have a chip that's been working for two years and you do the heating thing, at the, the absolute best case scenario, which is virtually never going to happen, is that it's going to last again for two years. Realistically speaking, it's going to last three months or three weeks. There's no way to really know. Next question here, what is the proper fix? The proper fix is always going to be uh, replacing the chip. You can't do anything with the inside of the chip, so realistically speaking, all you can do with BGA problems like that is replace the chip. Next statement here, you are pissed off that people are fixing them yourselves and taking money out of your bank account. Again, there are many ways that that was originally phrased in the messages I received, and most of them were received with uh, mostly expletives. But that was the general consensus of what, what, what people were saying. Uh, answer here, this would be a great angle if I actually fixed desktop graphics cards, which I don't. So it's not a service I offer. Since I don't offer this as a service, there's really no financial incentive for me to care what somebody does with their personal graphics card. Again, I don't fix them. Next statement. You said people shouldn't be able to reflow their own stuff in ovens. Honestly, I kind of lost my shit. Uh, you know, I, I've, this, I've been talking about how to do these repairs properly for a really long time in a very calm manner. And I said that after seven years of doing that, I see one of the largest tech channels on the internet pretty much saying, look, we baked something in an oven and it worked. And it's like, ah. the right thing to say here ultimately would have been, if you are going to put it in an oven, go for it, but just put it in the oven with the understanding of what you're actually doing. You should, whatever it is you're doing, I want you to do it because you actually understand what's going on. I want you to think. I want you to have some type of troubleshooting process that you go through. And I want you to really, I want you to know what you're doing. So if you're going to put something in an oven or heat it, Go for it, but just do it with the proper knowledge. You're not melting solder balls. What you're doing is you're moving away. You're moving the underfill around, uh, right, that it's around the C4 bumps that are putting things back together that are going to fall apart very soon after. If you know what you're doing, go for it. But be informed and be educated rather than, again, just listening to what you hear on the Internet. Because what you hear on the Internet, again, it's, it's, it's often wrong. The whole point of this channel is to get people to think independently and learn and educate themselves. And that's what I want here. At the crux of it, this channel exists to teach people that you don't need to be an engineer to know how a lot of this stuff works. You don't have to have some Ph.D. in electronics engineering to get things done. All I want you to do is a little bit of research to have a basic understanding of how things work so that you can make them work again and to have a basic healthy skepticism for bullshit that you read on the internet. That's what I'm trying to get across here. It's, again, it's not about being some genius engineer, it's just about knowing how things work. But Lewis, obviously no one puts things in an oven to fix them. It's obvious that people know that this is bullshit. Man, I wish that were true. I wish it were true that people never did this for real repairs, that real repair shops never did stuff like this. Sadly, real repair shops, well, real repair shops have done far worse. And this really started in 2006, when the, around 2006, 2007, with the HP DV9000 laptop. It was probably one of the worst laptops ever made. Very, it sold very, very well. And it had a just really, really bad chipset issue. And you had all these people realizing that if they heat the chip again, it'll work. And they were kind of wondering why. And they look up on the internet. They read the myths about the, the problem being in the solder balls and not the problem being inside the chip. And they think that they're doing a good thing. So you have all these people that were, you know, cashiers at Walgreens that are opening up their first laptop repair store that have never worked with electronics over the course of their natural life that are doing this. And they're charging their customers 60 or 100 or 200 or 300 in some cases, $400 to take a butane torch to the chip 
and then give them a 30-day warranty. And the issue here is that when this happens and the customer gets it back with that 30-day warranty after they paid a few hundred dollars for it and it doesn't work, that customer is going to be pissed off. They're going to come back. The shop owner is going to say, you get a 30-day warranty. Not much I can do. I told you you have a 30-day warranty. And what do you think they're going to do? They're going to hate everybody who does electronics repair for a living. They're going to be more skeptical. They're going to be more anxious. They're going to be more paranoid when it comes time to bring their devices to a repair technician because of the repair technician that screwed them. Now, some of these repair technicians were genuinely ignorant. Some of them simply believed that what they were doing was actually repair because of all the crap that they read on the Internet, all of the fake science that they heard being perpetrated on the Internet, all the demonstrations of this working on the Internet. So they think that they're doing a good thing because, again, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have to understand here that most of the people doing this, they were not the high-level top engineers and technicians. They were the cashiers at Walgreens that decided, I'm going to open a laptop repair place that, that are all, all over the place. And you had, so you had a lot of people that were ignorant, but you also had a lot of people that genuinely knew that what they were doing was bullshit, that they, they knew what they were doing was going to last 30 days. They knew what they were doing with the 30-day warranty. They knew the repair might last two months, but the law in their state is I only got to provide a 30-day warranty. And what do you think the customer is going to do when this happens? How do you think the customer is going to feel when they get this device back and it works for two months and the repair shop wants to charge them full price again? They're going to hate repair people in general. And it's not just about the people who did this. When that person gets screwed over by a technician, they're not only going to take that out on that technician, they're going to take it out on the person that services the water heater. They're going to take it out on the mechanic that works in their car. They're going to take it out on the person that fixes the refrigeration system at their restaurant. They're going to take it out on everybody else that works in the service industry that is working, repairing something that they don't know how to repair. It decreases consumer confidence in service technicians in general which it really helps nobody at all. And it's, you know, it's something that I deal with all the time. So I deal with people who walk in who are paranoid about what it is we're going to be doing for them because they've been screwed over by somebody else. And I always say in these videos, I like to be a part of the change that I want to see in the world. So if I'm annoyed with something, then rather than just complain about it, I'd like to actually try and fix it. As silly as it seems, next one. Ha ha ha! Look, your shit didn't work either! Ha ha! Your machine didn't fix it. It sure didn't. So one of the things that I wanted to do here, one of the things that he actually wanted to do was do this with a regular regular desktop graphics card. The issue is, is that he was, he was coming to New York for this auto show, and the timing of the auto show did not in any way correspond to the 6 to 12 weeks that it takes to get any of these chipsets from China. So as most people know, it's not, you don't go to Newegg.com and type in G84-603-A2 and have a chip show up in the mail one or two days later. You go to AliExpress or CIC or eBest or any one of these really kind of shady websites. You give them, you wire them your money, you cross your fingers, and you pray that in 6 to 12 weeks you actually get what you paid for. So I, I didn't want to just say, you know, we can't do a demonstrational video because I can't get a chip in that time frame. Seems kind of lame because it would I feel like it was a cool video to demonstrate how that would work. So when I originally had bought that machine, I bought this machine to deal with the defects in the 2011 model MacBook Pro that had been coming in every single day. I needed a machine that was more efficient at handling it. And Apple decided in 2015, four years after the machine was released, that they would actually finally decide to support their customers that spent over $2,000 on this product. And they decided to cover it and start replacing them for free, which is very, very nice of them, finally. So this after this happened around April of 2015, I'd say, I pretty much stopped turning that machine on more than, let's say, once or twice a month. So I didn't really have anything to actually work on here. So I decided to try and find something, and I found a board here that had this chip on it. This is the PCH for an Ivy Bridge MacBook Pro from 2012, and it has this nice big mark, this nice big chunk in it from when it was thrown across a room. So th there's obviously a couple of problems here, you know, could be something else on the board is bad, it could be the chip that I bought from, this, this chip actually came from L2 Computer, so if you guys work in this as a business, that should already send a chill down your spine if you know who L2 Computer is. <laughs> and th th and But the really, the, I would say that the main factor involved in this not working again is the fact that we were so busy going back and forth on bullshit we hate in technology that I didn't notice that the chip 
melted. Like, I, I you're supposed to use profiles for specific boards, but I virtually never work on this board. So I was using the profile for an A202915 on an A203115. And usually when I do that, it's fine because I'm paying attention to the screen. I see the screen. I'm looking at the screen. I'm paying attention to the screen. I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. And even if the profile is different than what I'm used to using, I can see, oh, it's done. The chip has sat down and it's been melting for about 10 or 15 seconds. Stop. Manual cooling. Done. What happened here is, oh, the chip's been melting for 45 seconds, but I'm not looking at the screen because we're busy complaining about the processors inside of modern televisions and the shitty resistive touchscreen in the Zalmo. It's been melting for like a minute and a half, and then I just think to look up, and it's like, wait, did that melt? <laughs> and then I look down at the time, and I'm used to that chip melting at 278 or 280 seconds, and it's like, yeah, we're way past that. And it was fucked. It is what it is. I'm not going to skip on something that's a pretty cool idea just because it may not wind up perfect. If you actually do want to see that uh, that working when it's it's done properly and actually passing, you can check out some of the videos above where I'm replacing different chips on different boards using that machine. And you can see the entire process from beginning to end when it's actually being done on boards that have a chance and it's actually being done by me when I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. But yeah, so let's move on to the next one here. What was the next set? Ah, you look stupid and weird in that video. Don't I kind of look stupid and weird in every video? I mean, really, I mean, like, are you watching this channel because I'm good looking? I, I, I sincerely hope that you're not because there are far better channels out there. But on a more serious note, uh, the way that I usually record these videos is I put up a camera, I hit record, and then I start, and when I'm done with my idea, I'm done, I hit stop recording. That's the way I'm used to recording. Today I'm doing it a little differently because my computer is actually screwed up and it's only allowing me to record in these one or two minute intervals, which is driving me nuts. But usually I record the entire thing and then I hit stop. And that's because I'm not really a YouTube person, I'm not a video person, I'm not a filmer, I'm not an artist, I'm just somebody filming my work. That's what I'm kind of used to doing. Linus does it very, very differently. He, 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 has, he like creates a script in his head of, of an outline of exactly how he's going to create the video. He has everything already outlined in his head. He knows where he wants to start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. Uh, and the thing is, I, I don't want this to come off as insulting because I really don't mean it as insulting. But if, if you're in the film world, the television world, the um, movie world, that is totally normal. If you're not in the film, television, or movie world... It's kind of fucking weird. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know how else to describe it other than like somebody walks in, says hello, introduces themselves, walks right back out, has a cameraman following him in, and then introduces himself again so that he could record it, and then does that a few times. I don't know. Kind of weird. And like, or like I'm standing here and I'm talking and then he goes, okay, start. Okay, cut. Okay, start. Okay, cut. Okay, now we're going to talk about this. Okay, now we're going to, okay, now explain that again to me. Okay, now I'm going to explain it on camera. I mean, it's just, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, okay, you want me to just like write all this stuff down and I'll just come back in a half hour when you guys are done? I don't, I'm not used to being around that style of filming. I'm not used to uh, recording anything in that way. So it's just really weird. The entire time I just kind of felt like I was in the way, particularly since this is like a 100 square foot office that has like three people in it. But just mostly the, the method of filming and recording is just, again, it's like it's something you're either used to or you're not. And that ain't something I'm used to. So there, there, was like a, there was a video that I did with Jessa and Sonny and uh, I believe Jason at the Practical Border Pair School. We just turned the camera on and we were reading the mail that, we were, that, that she got and we were, trying, we were just making jokes about it while drunk. That was kind of fun. But yeah, I'm just really not used to his style. And the style that he has clearly works for being able to put out a lot of content in a short period of time and not rambling. Because one of the largest criticisms of my videos, which I will admit is true, is that I repeat myself and I talk too much because I don't edit. But I don't, I don't know. I'm just not really comfortable with that whole start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, stop, stop. I just, it feels weird. It's just not the way I'm used to doing any of these videos. So, yeah. I actually watched that video when it came out on Vessel and it's like, man, I look like a fucking idiot. But I really, I had no idea what the hell I should be doing for half of that. It's like, I almost kind of wanted to say, okay, here's how this thing works. I'm going to get lunch. When you guys are when you guys are done, I'll come back. 
that was that was like all I could say. I, I thought throughout most of that process, but. It was still, I figured, an interesting thing to do. Like, again, well, what's the hurt? I got about 140 messages in my YouTube inbox. I would say that about 100 of them are filled with some uh, really negative insults and cursing and shit. And honestly, like, I mean, I can't say that I really, it, it, it really, like, what is the, what is the, what is the negative repercussion of an insult on the internet? I mean, there is none. <laughs> There really is none. So hopefully this has been informative, particularly the beginning of it, where I explained the real issue with the BGA chipsets. And again, thank you for watching. If you found any of this informative, I'm glad. And that's it for today.